In the wake of George Floyd's murder, our country has erupted into a historic movement calling for racial equity and a change in our policing methods. Bridge USA believes in the need for dialogue in order to understand the experiences and viewpoints of others as a way to build a more empathetic politics. This event will showcase exactly what that means when it comes to reimagining policing. You have all of these um, systems and perceptions working kind of hand in hand um, to kind of create the environment that is pretty dangerous for, for Black people today um, in their interactions with law enforcement and also the distrust, distrust that Black people have with law enforcement today. And they're inherently viewed as criminal. Um, because they don't work hard enough and they can't pull their, their, their um, selves up by their boot shops. But how can you do that when the boot shops don't exist for you, you know? So I think a lot of these problems, you know, I think one solution could just honestly be reforming what we see as criminal and how uh, the police are used for issues that are not necessarily um, should be dealt with in a criminal way, in a punitive way, um, like mental health, drug addiction, um, so on and so forth. What needs to happen to change the culture of police doing us versus them, especially when it comes to minorities, is more community engagement. If I'm a minority and I just see a police car drive through or a police officer only shows up to arrest me or family member, how much trust will I have in the police? They're taking officers out of the schools. To me, that's a huge mistake because one of the first contacts we want uh, young people to have with law enforcement is positive. So if they can be a positive role model in schools, uh, not enforcing school rules, but simply just being there to, to keep the place safe, but also mentoring folks, showing them uh, what law enforcement's about and how they can work together to try to solve some of the problems that we have in the communities, that, that will go a long way because simply just being a gun, a badge, maybe a car driving by, those solutions don't work. You don't get to know people. We do have a chance not only to perceive this as a problem, but also as a tremendous opportunity to recruit a more, uh, more diverse police force, a police force that has more women, more minorities, more immigrants, more locals, more professionals. You know, we can talk about all these nice reforms, community policing, um, which are all quote unquote good, having more black and um, brown people on a police force. But I think if we don't address the issue of how we're, treating and what we're treating as criminal, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Um, oftentimes, you know, you go to a middle class neighborhood, you don't see as many police in that neighborhood, and therefore you have less interaction or negative interaction with police. But you go into a, uh, you know, a low income community, and especially a low income community of color, and you see so many police officers, you see it in Baltimore all the time. Most times, that police officers are in a neighborhood, it's because they've either been called there or the crime statistics tend to be higher. Law enforcement's run pretty thin. Deploying your officers in a way that, that addresses crime, and not just crimes, we do it for car wrecks, you know, if there's certain intersections where people are in the red light, that's where you put your traffic officers. If there are burglaries in the area, you put your officers there. A few years ago, the Justice Department came in and did an assessment uh, in Baltimore City and found that the overwhelming majority of arrests for trespass, for loitering, for these petty offenses were African American. So even as the residents are calling uh, for help with respect to serious crime from, you know, drug trafficking by violent organizations to carjackings and robberies and shootings and killings, um, what they don't want to see is policing of loitering and trespass uh, under the pretext that that's some strategy to go after the violent criminals. It's not. Hire, train, supervise, and retain officers in the right way. If you hire the wrong person, train them in the wrong way, don't su supervise them correctly and retain them, that's got to change. Trust me, departments are trying to do that. The difficulty is when the economy's good and you're going to pay somebody forty to $50,000 a year, to put their life at risk, work nights, weekends, holidays, sometimes you're not gonna get the best people. And right now, I can guarantee there are departments, Minneapolis is a perfect example. There is a culture there that is a huge problem. We've seen it with the union, we've seen it with the people that show up at the uh, political events. Those officers that act in the, and behave in that way are terrible for the community and give policing a bad name. You know, our schools um, are, 
where so much of the problems we see in society begin and persist. Um, and they are as segregated uh, today as they were five decades ago. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, he was writing a dissent in a case in 1972 out of Detroit, where he said, if our children do not begin to learn together, there is little hope our people will ever learn to live together. Inner city schools, their property values are lower. Um, they have to, um, and then they go to uh, underfunded schools. Um, and that breeds, you know, the prison to, you know, school to prison pipeline and all those things that, that kind of roll out from that. And then also, instead of treating drug issues as if they're, um, you know, criminal issues, they should be treated as mental health issues. We're also stopping people from committing burglaries and robberies to support their drug habit. That's where it crosses over. But if some, somebody's a user and an addict and it, and it is becoming a problem within the family, the police don't want to deal with that. Their resources are better somewhere else. It would be nice if we could get some other sort of community involvement. The problem is it costs money to do that. And how you're going to get people, people don't want their taxes raised, they don't want their money going somewhere else. If your mayor, city manager, uh, council and police chief are all on board, and I can tell you it's very difficult to get that to happen for a lot of changes, but if they all are on board, that's how you get it to be done. I really do think that one of the challenges is that we have a culture where compromise is not considered a good thing. Um, and the police unions are guilty of this, uh, the politicians are guilty of this, where we adopt extreme positions and we don't work on the common sense, common ground. Um, whether it's chokeholds or uh, qualified immunity, there are some things that should not be hard to build consensus around, uh, but the FOPs, the, the, the police unions, um, it's an all or nothing for them. They think in even a modest concession on qualified immunity or chokeholds is taking away all of their rights. And politicians, uh, uh, conversely, too often say we need to deliver everything uh, in order to achieve some progress. That's just not true. And I think trying to find uh, a common ground in today's political culture is very difficult. Um, but I do think that that's going to be a really important model to see, whether it's at the federal level or at the local level, seeing uh, police unions and politicians coming together to make some uh, concrete steps forward uh, would be a terrific template for the nation to follow. And I think it's really important just to say to everybody that's viewing that you need to vote. <laughs> that's like needless to say, you need to vote. It's very important to hold your elected officials accountable because they are your servants. They are public servants and you're allowed to hold them accountable.